So obviously much of what preoccupies enthusiasts in their collecting journey is simply buying the next watch in their collection. But one of the key parts of any watch collector's journey is acquiring straps as a way to change the look of their pieces. For me, this was a huge and one of the best ways to get a new watch feeling without paying the money for a new watch. But just like any element of watch collecting, things can turn rather complicated and become an overabundance of information to digest. So in this video, what we're gonna be doing is covering essentially everything you need to know about watch straps and bracelets. So a couple of points of emphasis here before we dive into this video is the range of information here is going to span from pretty basic to more advanced terminology, but no matter what your level or knowledge is, I think that this is probably gonna be a helpful video and have a ton of information that you can go back to. We're also gonna mark chapters down below as well so you can easily follow along or jump around. And pretty much every single strap that we cover in this video, we're gonna mark in the description down below as we do sell many of them uh, and also link to the video how our watch straps are made because I think that will be helpful in kind of describing this further. So this is going to be a longer video. So just to create a general table of contents for the video today, we're gonna cover the following. First, looking at basic strap terms that you should know. Then moving into how to change a watch strap and go into the details of that with some tips. Talk about different leather strap types, rubber strap types, nylon and fabric straps, then other miscellaneous straps to also be aware of. Then move into the world of bracelets. And then at the end, we're gonna go through kind of some of the best practices for styling and pairing straps on watches with a few different specific examples. But guys, let's jump in and start with looking at basic strap knowledge. Now, before we get too deep into kind of the different types of straps, it's important to talk about some of the general terminology that needs to be known in order to cover this properly. And if you want a comprehensive term video, I'm not gonna spend all the time in this, I would definitely recommend looking at our 75 watch terms that every single watch collector should know. So I will link to that down below. Now for the first term here, we have lugs. Now you have to know this, these are the protruding ends on both the top and the bottom of the watch case that are used to attach a strap or bracelet to a watch. Now the distance between those two lugs is known as lug width. Now most lug width is gonna be between 16 and 24 millimeters, typically even numbered lug width, but there are many brands that still use odd number lug width. So just keep that in mind. I find in many cases you can fit even numbered straps if you do size up in odd number lug widths. Not always, if it's a more rigid material, this is not gonna work, but just keep that in mind as you're looking at lug width. This is an absolutely imperative thing to know when you're trying to swap out straps on your watches. And now, of course, pretty basic term is strap. Now, this is a band made traditionally of leather, rubber, or nylon, which affixes the watch to the wrist. You can also use the word band as a substitute here. There really is no wrong answer. But one point I will mention though, when you're talking about bracelets, I wouldn't refer to that as a strap or a band. I think most people just commonly agree to refer that as a bracelet. Then we have integrated lugs. So it's important to note some watches require their own special strap or bracelet as the lugs have a proprietary design that work only with that bracelet or strap, and it's gonna cause something custom. Good examples of this, Oris Aquis, or say the AP Royal Oak. When looking on the reverse end of a strap, we can talk about pin buckles. So on the majority of basic straps, this is the type of operation that you'll find. It basically follows the same type of execution as your belt. Buckles also operate with a spring bar in most cases, meaning that they can easily be changed out for a different look or for a different type of clasp altogether, something like a deployant, as long as you know the measured width of that buckle end. Now this is typically provided by many manufacturers. On our website, it does provide this, but not always. So just keep it in mind because there are sometimes tapering of straps. And in most cases, that's going to happen. Then you have deployment class. Now this is not deployment class. That's something I see quite a bit. Now this is a class that can be affixed to a standard leather or textile strap, often seen on more upmarket dressier watches. And unlike a pin buckle, a deployment opens in a butterfly manner in order to preserve the strap from wear and provide a more refined look with time. Making all this happen though are spring bars. And now these are the small spring loaded bars or pins that actually hold the strap in place by popping into the small holes in the lugs. There are also outliers that use screwed bars, actually screwing them directly into the case. But in most cases, you're gonna be seeing a spring bar. Now to operate a spring bar or remove it, you need a spring bar tool. So this is going to be your Swiss army knife when it comes to changing out straps. These tools typically have a tiny fork on one end for grabbing hold of the spring bar to remove it or install a strap as well as a straight end 
often used for watches with lug holes or sizing up micro adjustment points within a clasp. When it comes to which ones to purchase, there are so many out there. I find it's better to spend a little bit more money getting the best one that you can. I would recommend Bergen. They've been making these things for literally centuries. Um, they're a Swiss made company. Uh, definitely would recommend theirs. We have them on our site. I've used the cheaper ones. And when you're dealing with expensive watches using cheap tools, it typically doesn't end very well. They'll strip and it just, typically can create some disasters. So definitely recommend those, invest in a quality one because you're gonna be using it a lot. But now that we have some idea of terminology surrounding straps and the tools you need to change them, let's now demonstrate how you actually change out a strap from a watch at the comfort of your own home. Now, there are tons of videos that do this on just line. So this isn't the first time that's ever happened, but just wanted to go through some details of how I do it and what I have found works really well for myself. Now, changing up the strap on your watch can serve several purposes, from simply replacing something that's worn out or changing up the look of your watch overall. I don't think I need to go into really the reasons why, but it's just a relatively inexpensive way to make a big change in your watch and how it looks. But okay, so to start here, what you'll need is a clean work surface that won't scratch up your watch, a spring bar tool, and of course, the watch with the strap attached and the new strap that you're gonna swap in. Now, first to begin, take the fork end of the spring bar tool, work your way between the edge of the strap and the lug until you find the spring bar end, being careful, of course, not to scratch the inside of the lug or tear inside the edge of the strap. One trick here that I use quite a bit is to take a thin piece of tape and put it on the back of the lug in order to prevent scratches. I find this really useful when you're working with luxury watches, which I do quite a bit. And this is gonna prevent a lot of that spring bar action from scraping up against the back of the lug. So most spring bars are gonna have a raised ridge to make it easier to grab with that spring bar tool. And once you've found that, pull the spring bar away when pressing down until you feel it dislodge. Depending on how flexible your old strap material is, you can generally pull the strap out at this point. If it's a tighter fit, repeat the process on the other side until both ends of the spring bars are out of their respective holes. Another tip I would recommend is to use your non-dominant hand to hold the strap and spring bar still to ensure the spring bar doesn't fly out across the room when you apply pressure as you are backloading that spring and the thing can fly everywhere. This is especially important when you're dealing with nylon straps where the hole is not as tight that thing can just fly out. So keep that in mind. If you're lucky enough to be working with a watch with drilled lugs, the process is even simpler as all you'll need to do is insert the straight end of the spring bar tool into the lug from the outside while applying just a little bit of pressure to the lug end of that strap until the spring bar pops out. Since the spring bar is going to be less controlled, I again would strongly recommend tape if you're worried about scratching your watch and definitely grab a hold of that spring bar as well to make sure it doesn't go flying. In terms of reinstalling the new strap after switching over the spring bars. It's easiest to get one of the spring bar sides in place, then to press the other end with your spring bar tool and then guide it into the hole on the other side. There, it can be a little bit of a learning curve, but once you're comfortable changing out different straps, it opens up a whole new world of styling your watch in an inexpensive way. As straps are, again, just a great way to make a huge impression on the overall look of a piece. So now for this next section, let's look at the different categories of materials and strap types, starting with the most common, with leather. So now, as you might imagine, most leather straps are made from natural hides from an animal, whether it's traditional cow leather or something like an exotic leather, such as lizard, alligator, which we'll get into all the different types. Now, generally speaking, leather straps are comfortable to wear and break in over time, like a good pair of shoes, to create a near custom experience on the wrist. Now, one thing I want to mention about leather watch straps is that these take much more time than you would probably think. I have a video on our channel where we actually visited our manufacturing partner here in the United States where we make all of our made in the USA straps. And each strap that is made undergoes over a dozen different steps. And believe it or not, it's harder and more involved to make a watch strap than something like a belt and other leather goods. So just keep that in mind. The variation and quality can fluctuate greatly and don't let the size of them lead to you writing them off as just being a simple uh, manufacturing experience. Now this does depend, but in terms of durability, Leather is usually a long lasting material, though it isn't always a great option for excessively sweaty wear or anything aquatic as water can break leather down, make it stretch and also alter the appearance for the worse. Though it is important to note that there are treated leather straps as well as composite leather straps with rubber backing, for example, that can handle some of this uh, used to perspiration and allow the strap to take on these type of scenarios. Depending on the individual wearer and lifestyle, a good quality leather strap can last four years 
if taken care of properly. Now let's talk about the different types of leather straps. And let's talk about the different grains and level of materials used here, because this is something not many people I think consider. So first you have full grain, and this is commonly seen as the best quality leather that you can get. Full grain includes the entire top layer of the animal's hide and is generally more expensive and challenging to manufacture. As a caveat, since you are using the outermost part of the hide, it also can show signs of marks, scars, making this not as uniform as some might like and making it a bit more unique like a fingerprint. Full grain is also somewhat absorbent and will patina over time, getting that more of that natural age look from the leather. Now we have top grain, and this is another higher grade of leather similar to that of full grain, but with the outermost surface of the hide removed and in many cases polished. So this makes the material less unique as it is finished in a uniform pattern and is easier for a manufacturer to manipulate. It is still a very quality leather when it comes to straps as it will still offer nice durability. That considered, the level of patina will not be as noticeable or natural than that of full grain. And all the straps on our site are using both full grain and top grain leather just as a point. Then you have split grain. So this is derived from the inner surface of a hide without any indication of the actual outer layer most commonly seen in the use of suede and is useful as a more pliable leather and is needed for a certain aesthetic that is trying to be achieved. Then you have genuine leather, and this is the most complicated and loaded term of the bunch by far, as it is a term that has been manipulated by lower end manufacturers that are trying to market scraps as a higher end product. Genuine leather commonly is referring to the lowest part of the hide where the semantics of this starts to get a bit tougher is that it is often used as a blanket statement and term to describe all sorts of quality. And some brands use words like genuine in their product naming as a way to help identify uh, and help sell products for a casual buyer. Where it starts to get a little bit sketchy is when you start getting into a world of some manufacturers that stretch this term even more and take this material and throw it in with some other materials like glue, shavings, and anything that they can find to create a bonded approach, but package it as genuine. So in short, this is the leather type that is going to host the widest spectrum of quality. So just understand what is actually being referred to here and what this means, and don't be afraid to ask for clarification from a manufacturer on their process. So now you have exotics. Now this is just basically any other animal Animal skins other than the familiar cow or calf that are commonly used in watch straps due to their interesting textures and visual appearance. It's usually in dressier scenarios that you'll see these exotic skins used. So first up we have alligators and alligators are, I would say are probably considered the most go-to reptilian skin when going in this direction. They're known for their large squared individual scales more in a three-dimensional feel. Also, when dealing with any exotics, alligators specifically, certain parts of the body are gonna dictate where those material can really be pulled from. With alligators, the belly scales are the most sought after, really seen as kind of that filet mignon of the piece. So definitely check out the video where I go into more detail about where this is gonna be pulling from, looking at different skins in the exotic point of view. Also very desirable and very similar, crocodile straps. They have more of a rounded or bubbled scale compared to that of alligator. It's gonna be the number one way to identify which one is which, but typically are using the sides because those are gonna be reinforced a bit more and are not gonna give way like that of the belly. So look for the scales as the number one way to identify the difference, more rounded, bubbled off compared to the squared off and more, I would say, three-dimensional look of that of the alligator. Then you have lizard, and most commonly this is gonna be seen in vintage watches as well as women's watches. Dress watch is gonna be using these a lot. Now this typically refers to skins, of course, made from different types of lizards. Teju as well as Java lizards are gonna be the most popular and they're really known for their fine grain scales that are going to really add a lot of texture and look and are easy to identify. So one note when looking at exotic leathers in general, mostly when dealing with reptilian leather, is there will be a marking of these as genuine. And that's, again, kind of going to show the difficulty of the semantics of genuine leather and the difficulty of identifying what is which. But look for that when identifying reptilian leathers because there are also different reptilian grains. And basically the difference of this, and this is something a lot of manufacturers do to create that high-end look without actually getting these leather hides, which costs thousands of dollars for a lot of these expensive hides. It is very expensive to produce these straps, I know from firsthand. But what they'll do is they'll take traditional calfskin and then with a pressing process, 
allow that grain, that alligator or any type of grain that they want to get uh, effectively across at a more attainable way. Now, this is a great way to get that look on a budget, but also keep in mind, this is a way that some manufacturers kind of manipulate and kind of give off a higher end look without maybe putting in the actual quality standard to match that. So just keep that in mind. All the grains that we use, I really were testing them and making sure that they really did work the part. Also, when you're dealing with exotics, another reason why manufacturers go this route uh, for these different grains is just shipping internationally. Customs, there's a lot of limitations for shipping shipping these type of exotic materials across different borders. So that's another reason why a lot of manufacturers pair up grains with the watches that they are selling. Next up here, we have ostrich straps. So these are known for the exotic goosebump signature, a leftover of the ostrich's large quill-like feathers. Ostrich is another interesting, if seldom seen material used in watch straps, but it definitely does have its just huge proponents. Ostrich is also prized for its suppleness and comfort despite having an extremely high level of strength. Then you have Cordovan. So this is a high quality leather taken from flat connective tissue of a horse, which is one of the most expensive materials to work with and is used in a variety of leather goods, most notably for shoes. Now the material is often executed and known for its ability to have an unmatched shine and uniform look throughout the entire material. Next we have Stingray, and given the current attitudes on ocean conservation, I doubt we'll be seeing a lot more of this in the future, but Stingray straps are a material that is known for its heavily pebbled and kind of grain-like finish and unique look and feel. Then to follow there, a lot of the same attitudes here, but looking at Shark. Shark is definitely known for its unique texture and feel, and is going to have more of an abrasive type of finish compared to some of these other straps mentioned. Now, ironically, when it comes to Stingray, all these reptilian straps, shark straps, these are straps that can't go into the water as they are going to be processed and are not going to be able to resist water to that degree. I've seen people joke about this, hey, it's an alligator, I can bring it in the water. No, you can't, keep that in mind when looking at these straps, of course. But say you do want something that's gonna be able to handle water much more effectively that's where rubber straps can come into play. Now, there are quite a few different straps when you're dealing with rubber, but rubber are typically paired with dive watches or other sport watches that will be able to tank these really intensive situations. They're non-absorbent and therefore don't get wet or need to dry. So they're great when just dipping into the water and quickly needing to dry off. Great choices for that. A couple other points is rubber straps are a little bit thicker on the wrist. They do need to be broken in quite a bit, but they do last quite a long time. So now there are quite a bit of different rubber straps. Let's first look at natural rubber. On most watches, especially on the higher end, these are gonna be used. And natural rubber as in vulcanized rubber stemming from the milky latex extracted from rubber trees. This is typically highly prized for its refined feel, durability, comfort, as well as the fact that natural rubber doesn't pick up lint like its artificial relative, silicon. So silicon Silicone is a highly durable and long-lasting synthetic elastomer rubber, generally produced without any natural products like the rubber or used in natural rubber straps. Silicone is resistant to heat and abrasion while also being generally inexpensive and easily molded to suit a number of different tasks. In terms of its feel, many enthusiasts will say it doesn't feel as premium or luxurious as natural rubber and also has a tendency to pick up lint, especially in cheaper silicone executions. Then you have polyurethane urethane or used as PU in some type of naming conventions. It's known for being a bit stiffer compared to that of natural rubber and silicone, but also highly durable. And this is a material highly used by that of those entry level dive watch brands, Seiko, Citizen. But now if you're interested in having durability and water friendliness of something like rubber, but not interested in the clammy feeling against the skin that rubber can sometimes feel and create, there are also a number of excellent options when it comes to nylon or other woven fabric straps. So when you're first getting into watches, you'll commonly hear the term NATO strap. And this is generally refers to that watch strap made of a woven nylon, though the term has a more exact definition we'll get into later. Nylon straps are usually extremely affordable, comfortable, breathable, given their woven nature, and of course, totally indifferent to their exposure of water. If your nylon strap eventually takes on some stink, it can be easily removed, washed, dried, and reinstalled. A good nylon strap lasts a very long time, though keep in mind the colors might fade after some considerable wear. With these characteristics in mind, nylon straps are often associated with dive watches or tool watches and are a fun, cheap way to change things up in this, that look of your watch. Now to begin with that term NATO strap, and it comes from a very specific source, 
a watch strap designed for the British military in 1973 known as the G10, an abbreviation of form G1098. Used to request this strap from the Ministry of Defense's official supply channels back in the day. Because of the strap had a NATO stocking number or NSN, the strap has become known as the NATO. The NATO strap in general is nylon, most often equipped with stainless steel hardware and makes use of a pull through design that will keep a watch attached to the wrist even in the event of a spring bar failing. A handy feature for divers or those that are really gonna push their watches to the limits. Then you have Zulu, and these are generally built around the same principles of that of a NATO strap, but the term Zulu refers to a strap made from a thicker nylon and generally is going to be heavier, more rounded stainless steel hardware compared to that of a NATO. Zulu straps also can have four or five rings and operate much as does a NATO, or can be a simple one piece pull through on some models. Some people just call those NATOs as well, but you'll also hear Zulu being thrown around quite a bit. Then you have Perlon. Perlon is actually a once trademark commercial name for a woven nylon pull through strap made by a German watch brand back in the 1950s. Though many brands produce them nowadays, these will have more of a woven texture and look to them. Pretty much nothing else like them. I find them not to be as comfortable as some other nylon straps out there, but certainly a cool and unique look. While we've done our best to be comprehensive in this video, there are a few outliers that are worth knowing as well, but don't necessarily fit the aforementioned categories. One is going to be Cordura. So this is a trademark name for a collection of special synthetic materials that is in many ways similar to ballistic nylon as is often used in military gear, but with a slightly different fiber structure that lends itself to being even more resistant to abrasion compared to that of standard nylon. This is great for dye watches as well as tool watches for an everyday type of pairing. Next you have canvas. So this is a woven textile composed of natural fibers, whether that's hemp, cotton, flax, but most often cotton, especially when it comes to watch straps. And compared to nylon, cotton isn't as durable or resistant to water, abrasions, or UV light, but cotton does break in nicely and is the perfect look for complementing an old school field watch. Next you have Jacquard, which is essentially a fancy French process for creating a woven nylon or cotton textile with a variety of different woven patterns now famously utilized by Tudor in their woven nylon straps. It's characterized by an especially dense weave and high thread count compared to that of something like a standard NATO style strap. Then you have synthetic leather sustainable options. I'm gonna go into a group of them just kind of together as there are a variety here that can be utilized, basically just using organic or sustainable waste, such as apple skins as an example for something kind of crazy. Uh, Larica, you have Sequal, fan materials made from ocean plastic, quite a bit, things in the world of conservation and vegan straps have really taken off in the last several years. And there's quite a few different options that really hold up to their leather counterparts. All right, so now let's look at the world of bracelets. Now bracelets obviously being different than straps from just their material and what they're utilizing. Stainless steel being the common use case here, but there are other metals of course on the market out there. In terms of where we'll begin here when looking at bracelets, I think first just talk about a few points of uh, understanding when it comes to terms and then get into the different types. But one thing before we get into that, I do wanna mention is bracelets can get a little bit trickier when you're talking about lug width and matching the specific tone of the steel with that of the case, if you're going for an aftermarket type of solution, also with just how that end link is going to meet the case, it's a little bit harder to get a perfect fit compared to that of a strap. So just keep that in mind, but typically there are a lot of good third-party options out there if you do wanna switch something out. Now for the first term to understand here are links. And I would imagine this is a pretty straightforward one, but links are the smaller individual metal components that are screwed together to form a watch bracelet. They could be folded steel, solid, or some combination and are shaped according to a number of different designs we'll get into. You also will have end links. Now the end link is the specially shaped link where the bracelet meets the watch case. These can be solid, also known as SEL or solid end links or folded, with solid being considered the more premium as it doesn't give off a more rattly feeling or jangly feeling compared to that of folded links. Then you have clasp. Now these are the closure of a watch bracelet. There are a number of different kinds, including fold over, push button, butterfly. There are a ton out there. You also have divers extensions that can be typically found in a class that can be used to quickly allow a watch to fit over a wetsuit, dry suit. 
and this is typically used by dive watches. And this could also be a great way to add extension on the fly within that clasp. So now to talk about perhaps the most popular style of bracelet, and just for the lack of a better term, we're just gonna call this an oyster bracelet. This was made, of course, most popular by Rolex with their oyster style. It's going to have a few different links on there. It's perhaps one of the most popular style of bracelets on the market, originally introduced by Rolex in the 1930s. The oyster bracelet is characterized by a three link design with the center link offset by two outer links in a way that makes for a comfortable, flexible design. Rolex's Oyster is still utilized on the majority of their bracelet offerings, or at least offered. Then you also have the Jubilee, another Rolex invention, or at least name that was kind of attributed to the style. The Jubilee was released in 1945 to celebrate Rolex's 40 year anniversary. It's characterized by larger half circle shaped links with the flat side against the wrist and a series of smaller semicircular links within that that are often polished. The Jubilee is more flexible and therefore more often comfortable compared to that of the Oyster, especially when you're talking about wearing a bit smaller. A great modern example of this was the reintroduction of the Jubilee on the GMT Master II. Then you have mesh straps. The mesh watch bracelet, also known as a Milanese, thanks to Milan's history of producing fine wire mesh, is produced from the careful interweaving of usually stainless steel wire, an effect that in many cases produces a flexible, comfortable, and refined overall look. The hard part is with sizing as mesh doesn't inherently allow for removing links. So typically it's going to utilize a sliding clasp. Then you have beads of rice bracelets. So similar to a Jubilee, the beads of rice bracelet relies on larger, flatter outer links with a series of often polished beads set within, a look that is commonly associated with Dox's sub series of diving watches. And like a Jubilee, the beads of rice with its many rounded links is flexible, breathable, and especially comfortable. All right, so now this has become a very long video, but now at the end here, I want to just look at some of the best practices when it comes to pairing straps with different watches. So I basically have four different watches that I wanna look at and go through some different pairings that I think look good. Now I'm a believer that less is more when it comes to straps. So if you're dealing with exotic colored dials, like something from like Zodiac, maybe it's not the best idea to put on like a crazy striped NATO strap. Keep things simple, stick to what looks good. Uh, you of course have fun if you wanna have fun. I don't think you should necessarily create all these rules around it, but these are just typically some of the best practices that I try to uphold when looking at different watches and straps for pairings. Now, first up we have the Marathon GSAR, of course being a government military watch. This is going to fit a certain type of style. And for pairing with this watch, being a dive watch, I think the perfect option here to start would be looking at a rubber strap. Marathon comes with great rubber straps out of the box. They look fantastic with it. I think going for a traditional black to complement the dial really works well in this instance. You could also go for a two-piece nylon strap for a bit of a different look. And with the sand option, I think it works well with really drawing the eyes into that central dial. Then you have a couple different NATO options. My two just defaults when it comes to NATOs are gray NATOs, but also black NATOs is maybe being another close second or third. In this instance, I think a gray NATO strap just looks so good on a dive watch, especially one with more muted colors. In this instance, it looks fantastic. You also could throw a black NATO strap on to really just match the look of that dial. Next here, we have an absolute strap monster with the Hamilton Khaki Field Auto. Essentially, almost anything looks good on this watch. I love pairing different straps with the Khaki collection in general. They just work so well when it comes to pairing different straps. For a few different options here, just to kind of show how this works, I think a Cordura strap, great with kind of that military look. A sand will really, I think, bring out that dial with its overall look, very similar to that of the Marathon we just looked at. Also when dealing with military watches, I think a distress look can look great. So this tan distress crazy horse leather strap, it just looks the part when pairing it with this Hamilton. And then to round it out with something that's a bit more dressy or maybe dressed up to some degree, going for this brown genuine oil tan leather with contrasted stitching, which I think just creates a good contrast. Then moving into another watch that I think works in a variety of different situations with a variety of different straps is the Maxbill Chronoscope. Now this is a watch that I pair all the time with different straps. I've had a ton of fun with it over the years. First being a tan Hermes leather, just to give it a little bit of a different look. This is a strap that kind of embodies a lot of that Hermes kind of calling card outer grain leather that just looks the part, kind of more upscale, but also can work in a variety of different colorways. 
ways. It looks really fun, but also very refined. Then you have the black shell Cordovan strap, that nice shiny effect that comes with this strap. Very unique to that of Cordovan and works well with this pairing. Then looking into something a bit more dressy, you also have the brown genuine vegetable tan ply leather that also works with this piece or this tan shrunken grain genuine Italian leather as well. And then to round it out, when it comes to the Maxima Chronoscope, this is also a watch and just look, I think for some type of chronographs of this nature, a mesh stainless steel bracelet can also work very well with this piece. Kind of a bit of a cheat code though, this watch just looks so good with such a variety of different straps. And then to round it out, to provide something a little bit different, when you're dealing with vintage watches and dress watches, I think this allows you to kind of get into a different world and really lean into the use of reptilian grain or exotic straps. First pairing we have here is a black crocodile strap that really does look the part. Lizard straps also just epitomize this era to me, uh, whether you're dealing with a brown or black. When dealing with gold, I think both can look the part. I personally have a bit more preference to brown as a strap because I think it's a bit more versatile. I like to typically match when I'm dealing with a more dressy type of scenario like this, the strap leather with my belt or my shoes because I think it does bring the whole outfit together a bit more. And then also dealing with alligator, alligator crocodile. I think crocodile has a bit more of a retro look than that of alligator. I think alligator holds up a little bit over time. It just looks a bit more casual in some circumstances as well. And I'm just a bit more in favor of it. Uh, but in this circumstance, both work well. And of course you could throw in a ton of different calfskin straps. I find for dressier scenarios, you want probably matching leather. A contrast stitching is gonna think create more of a casual type of look. When it comes to this, I don't think there is a right or wrong way to do things. I think it's all about having fun, trying to maximize what your watch is capable of. So just get some different straps, try things out, be honest with yourself of what works and what doesn't work and just have a ball at it. That's really what it's all about when it comes to different straps. But guys, that is going to conclude this video. I apologize for the length of this one, but I hope that you did find it helpful. This one took a ton of time to put together. So if you did enjoy it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon as that is a great indicator. Also, if you are in the market for any of the straps that you see here, you wanna take this into your own hands and try something new, definitely check out the different straps that we have available on our site, teddybaldestar.com. Many of those straps are being made in the USA. We have some great manufacturing partners. Over the years of selling straps, I've worked with good providers, bad providers, and learned a lot in this arena. Uh, so very, very confident in the straps that we're offering. And also check out that video as well as how many of them are made in addition to that. Also, if you wanna stay up to date with the content, be sure to follow on Instagram as well. So it's a great way to also communicate a bit more personally on a day-to-day -day perspective. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.